Some time ago, someone somewhere asked me to do a video compilation of images I've taken with the GFX 50S. Seeing as how I am now selling the thing, it's as good a time as any to do that. And for good measure, I'll throw in a few chintzy parting words and uh, a review of sorts. Hopefully not too long, but hopefully not too short. Before I do that though, and on the cusp of me leaving this part of the Fujifilm ILC world, I have one burning and unanswered question on my lips. It is this. Do Fujifilm really get photographers? It's obvious, right? I mean, look, they have labeled and dedicated shutter and aperture dials and brookie angles and sometimes even optical viewfinders. Each is festooned like candy across their frames. That is getting it, isn't it? Anyway, I've made a list of oft said things from both new and old X and GFX users that peg Fujifilm as a camera company that gets photographers. Number one, their cameras look like classic film cameras. Two, their cameras operate like classic film cameras. Three, their cameras have great film simulations. Four, their cameras controls are intuitive. Five, their cameras show their settings even before you turn them on. Six, Kaizen firmware updates. Seven, Fujifilm really do listen to the feedback from their customers. Now I'm not going to answer each of these questions and to varying degrees I agree with the numbers 1, 3 and 7. But let's hit this thing from the rear. Especially recently Fujifilm have made serious, well recent changes to their bodies. They've improved both the battery in their latest body as well as the battery life of cameras with legacy batteries. They've made it easier to insert and remove SD cards by realigning them from cascaded columns to parallel lines. And in the GFX100, they have simplified the shutter speed controls and added IBIS. IBIS has also made its way into the H and now T lines, which feature more robust builds, new shutters and new high res EVFs. They've done all this whilst improving their JPEG engine and their newest cameras. But even Sony have improved their grips and joysticks. They've also biggened up their bodies more for comfortable operation. They've removed the rats from their once horrible raw engine. Canon have added joysticks and more card slots. Nikon have now done the same. So in such a milieu, what benefit have Fujifilm's improvements over and above those of their competition? After being a Fujifilm user for seven years, I must say that apart from JPEG film simulations, I believe that Fujifilm's cameras have nothing on their competition. Their autofocus is worse. Their battery life is worse. Their phone application is both unreliable and outmoded. In auto exposure modes, their endlessly chattering aperture blades and attendantly psychotic depth of focus ruin the what you see is what you get element integral to mirrorless photography. Their joysticks are smaller harder to use and no single button across their rear ends truly feels as if it was designed for a singular and important purpose. The manual focus rings of their lenses are often loose. If they're not loose, they are poorly placed. If they're not poorly placed, they're slippery or strangely ribbed. If the above denote a company that gets photographers, what denotes the opposite? Reliable autofocus, solid hand-friendly designs, purpose-built buttons, solid and reliable mobile applications, good battery life. What other good thing don't photographers get or want? Depending on the model, Fujifilm cameras look as much like your dad's contacts as they do a futuristic Zenit rangefinder. But Fuji's stylistic flourishes aren't just a nod to the past, and they aren't a simple hipster cope. In symbolic terms, X cameras are partial if cynical escapes from the factious modern world. Their exodus empties out into the halcyon days of local factories and businesses, of livable wages, affordable housing, and homey neighborhoods. Elements of life for which no modern hipster has any experience at all. Despite Fujifilm being an international conglomerate, their cameras fulfill a psychological, if skin-deep desire for stability, familiarity, and human control of the machine. And yet the X-series of cameras are cutting-edge computers barely contained by old-school faces. Every iteration complies with Moore's law, heaping complication upon complication, and ultimately broadening the psychotic rift between tradition and evolution. The 50s top-mounted LCD pushes to the fore the biggest lie hidden within the X-interface. 
that unless you menu dive to disable the command dial, the shutter speed dial is nothing but a guideline. You might think you're set for studio work when you twirl it to a maximum flashing speed of 1 over 125 and fire, but because you nudged the command dial below it, the shutter speed has snuck up or down. A bump down from there could end up in motion trails. A bump up from there will end in a black stripe across your photo. This inconsistency has been there all along. The top LCD merely reveals it in naked and real time. Take that tradition. The backs of every GFX and X camera bristle with buttons and dials whose common genesis is the late digital age. Today most are customizable, but not one is damped like the buttons on the back of a 5D. There is on and there is off and there is no in between. Of course, few buttons on a 5D's backside can be personalized, but not every button needs to be. And relying on endless customization disincentivizes good ground up design and engineering. In other words, if any button can be or can do anything, then no single button can properly hesitate or travel with the right size, heft, and or position necessary to nail a singular function. In a world of endless customization, design simply doesn't matter. In which case, nothing purposeful matters at all. Besides, if a user doesn't make use of AF on functionality, it is a waste of dedicated camera space. Because unique, purpose-built designs become impediments to gross functionality, human-oriented design in general takes a serious hit. Most of the GFX's buttons are just X-T3 buttons sized up. Not only do they lack travel room for safety presses, they lack a unique feel and or placement. Somehow, the tiny XT joy nipple has been faxed to the 50S completely unmodified. Even if you like the Fujifilm nipple, the 50S jams it up against its hump, making presses to the left or to the right difficult. And despite its size, the 50S staggers SD cards in the same cascaded manner seen in the X2, 3 and H. Even gloveless, removing a single card at a time can be tough. Its battery door locks into place nicely, but the other covers and flaps on the same side open a bit too easily to feel properly weather sealed. The 50S is a busy design that slap dashes classical elements and contemporary mirrorless accoutrements into an overall usable but ugly box. To be fair, the 50S began with a different modus operandi than did the X-Series. It aimed at delivering the basic feature set a professional needed in a reliable package. And reliable it is, but its Achilles heel is lag. Everything from EVF refresh rate to touch responsiveness and most importantly processor speed simply lags. The last one really makes itself known when shooting macro. If you haven't sufficiently burnt the subject in hot modeling lights and the room in massive halogen halos, focusing is damn near impossible at high magnifications. I reckon that a minimum of 15 frames per second is necessary to reliably focus on subjects for static macro photography. But magnify things more than one times in a regular indoor studio and the 50S drops the frame rate below 5 frames per second, at which pace it is impossible to visually tell apart bad focus from camera wobble. Still, it updates live feeds better and more smoothly than a CFV 50 or 50C. Of course, the 50C and 50 can be put on an outboard slider and focus done with a loop. Like the 50 and 50C, its Bayer sensor topping makes demosaicing a breeze, especially when compared with the X series. And make no mistake, its output is just as good as the 50C, which is incredible. But digital backs can be mounted to about any lens or any camera. Prior to the GFX 50S, I used both it and the 50C with a Lienhoff M679, CS Rollei Exact 2, Novaflex Ball Pro TS, and the massive Fujifilm GX680. Super wide angle lenses down to 23mm can be adapted on shift boards. With a digital back, you can go as compact or as massive as you want. For this reason, I miss the versatility of the digital back, but the costs, honestly, is prohibitive. Adapters start at $300 and typically run over $1,000. Focusing Bellow systems start at over a grand, and simpler helicoids, which require adapter boards themselves, start from $600. Then there are the lenses. Yes, they can be sharper than GFX lenses. Yes, they cover much larger image circles. Yes, they are more compact. But wide-angle board lenses start at seven grand. 
And if you want to get lots of background blur in a portrait or something, you're basically out of luck unless you toss in for a Hasselblad H series body and lenses. Or you can turn your back and Fujifilm GX680 into a digital Frankenstein camera. The GFX pulls much of that together into a single system. Speaking of lenses, the only native GFX lens I used at length is a 63 f2.8. Its image planarity is exemplary and it is sharp. It seems like it's a plum. The thing is that it never felt good in the hand. The focus ring was loose and the focus motor felt like it was being plunged forward or backward by a tiny army of tiny ants inside, heaving themselves toward or away from infinity. And every GFX lens I tried felt the same. To be fair, autofocus is and always has been an issue for Fujifilm cameras, but still I hoped that in their flagship system Fujifilm would pull out all the stops. They didn't and I sold the 63 long before I sold the GFX. Personal quibbles aside, the GFX is revolutionary, at least in the medium format world. In no time at all Fujifilm have debuted numerous and important lenses and the GFX has piqued the interest of both accessory makers and enthusiasts. Sure, it hasn't the fastest autofocus, but apart from some late model roll eyes, when did medium format ever speedily focus on anything? And no, a max flash sync speed of 1 over 125 isn't fast, but it does the job. Yes, the GFX50 is larger than the Hasselblad X1D, but it sports a high speed in-body mechanical shutter. And clumsy and ugly as its battery is, it returns life that embarrasses most of Fujifilm's other mirrorless camera lineup. No, the GFX isn't cheap, but it costs less than more complicated modular systems and it is as simple to use as other mirrorless cameras. Its lenses aren't as sharp as some of the best board lenses out there, or for that matter Hasselblad's X lenses, but they are better than most, if not all, contemporary DSLR lenses. The thing is that, in holistic terms, it does nothing better than the full frame competition. It autofocuses slower than just about any DSLR from the last two decades, has fewer lenses than its full frame competition, has worse battery life than the Sony's and the Canon's whose dynamic range and IQ are breathing down its neck, and it isn't as well laid out or purpose designed for use in a wide variety of cases. Yes, it shows better IQ than the top of the line Canon or Sony, but not by much. Yes, it is less expensive than most of the medium format competition, but apart from Leica's S, it's also less adaptable, and when adapted, it is more clumsy than a digital back. Finally, and I don't even want to get into it, Fujifilm's iOS app, which was bad in 2015, is retrograde today. The GFX's only mirrorless medium format competition is from Hasselblad. The X1D is smaller, has a simpler and more direct interface, better ergonomics, an equally solid body, better battery integration, but worse battery life, has sharper but more pricey lenses, and better software UI. It's also got a better app. Neither is as responsive as a current modular medium format DSLR, nor as adaptable. But Fujifilm have invested much more heavily into the GFX ecosystem, which is richer and moving forward faster than Hasselblad's. With the 50S and the GFX series in general, Fujifilm are writing some of the missteps they took early on with the X series. But while, for now, I remain in the X camp, I just sold the GFX. I hope the new owner loves it like I didn't. I hope it leaves him with scores of detailed images and a taste for an easy to use medium format system. I'm thankful for the great images it left me and the ones that you can see in this review, but I'm also left with a feeling that given the same bellows and lenses, neither myself nor anyone else could tell the difference in still life prints between images taken with the 50S or its full frame competition, be it the 5DSR or something much newer. In the end, I'm left with the same question. Do Fujifilm actually get photographers or do they get a certain design aesthetic? What Fujifilm didn't get about photographers like me was the need for purposeful design and consistency. Thank you very much for tuning in to me. If you want to subscribe on Twitter, you can do that. If you want to subscribe on Facebook, you can do that. No one's there. If you want to subscribe on Gab, you can do that. Minds, you can do that. Bitcho, you can do that. Here, do it. Leave a comment, thumb up, two thumbs down, whatever you want to do. If you want to buy a hat, it's 20 bucks shipped to you. And I've got, I've got an actual professional store with some cool designs coming up as well in case you don't want the hand done locally sourced shipped from me to you way you want it the old-fashioned capitalist way we can do that see you later